This is the On All Cylinders Podcast. Powered by Summit Racing. Your host for today is Summit Racing's David Fuller with special guest Ted Swan from Sherwin-Williams. Here we go. Welcome to another episode of the On All Cylinders podcast. I'm your host for this week, Dave Fuller. And, you know, this week we're going to talk a little bit about a topic that can scare even the most seasoned of hot rodders or performance enthusiasts, and that's paint and specifically doing your own paint and maybe even doing your own paint in your own home shop. So today our guest is Ted Swan from Sherwin-Williams Automotive Finishes. He's a tech rep there and a paint guru. And we're going to talk a little bit about just some things that, uh, you know, maybe you need to think about at the outset uh, when you're starting your first at-home paint job. So Ted, first of all, thanks for joining us. Oh, you're quite welcome. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've talked a, a little bit in the past already about just, you know, taking that leap of faith really into taking on really any project for the first time. But, you know, I think paint can scare people off. So we, we want to talk a little bit about some things to get started, you know, maybe a little bit about equipment and, and some practice that you can do. I guess, you know, starting back at the beginning, what's the, the first place people should start when gathering up materials for their first paint job? Well, first off, they want to actually decide what color they're going to use. It doesn't necessarily have to be something you have to make yourself. Uh, sometimes inspiration can come from a car that you saw on the street, or maybe even a new car sitting in a parking lot, even a bicycle. Uh, a bicycle, it could be uh, an antique motorcycle. I mean, some of the uh, Harley Davidsons from the 60s had really spectacularly cool blues and, uh, I don't want to say this, almost uh, colors that were like inspired by the sun with, you know, the best technology that they had available back then. You know, your inspiration could actually come from a lot of things. And believe it or not, uh, it could even come from nature. I mean, and, and you could find like on a website, if it was a solid color, Pantone, which is a uh, like a color classification company that's not, not just used on like things people make. They even have uh, color charts that match soil samples, muddy as that could almost sound. Mm -hmm. um, there are some spectacular soil colors or, or just colors in nature that uh, you could actually find probably on a website for these guys. So, you know, my, my color inspirations oftentimes come from I'm, I'm heavily into the uh, into blue, all, all kinds of blue, anything from like solid colors to uh, metallics and pearls. And if you look at this right now, we're in an era of very rich, vibrant blue, solid colors. A lot of the different companies have these blue colors now on cars, and I see more and more of them coming out. And one of the ones that I just noticed the other day, you know, grays are becoming very popular, like solid color grays. But Honda right now, the car division, not the uh, motorcycle division, actually has a color that does look gray. And then when you get close to it, you realize it has a greenish blue pearl in it. And it's actually a spectacular version of that color. I mean, gray, again, very, very popular. But to see somebody do something like that with it is, is actually a happy thing for me because I was actually out riding my bike, my bicycle with my wife. And we were in a parking lot. And I looked at this car and as I rode by, I was like, wow, that thing's got a really nice pearl to it that really showed off the shape of the car. And, and what I'm saying, obviously on body lines and stuff, but more to uh, what we're doing with specialty cars, the color would probably look spectacular on like a 41 Willys, a 55 Chevy, or even an old Volkswagen Beetle. I mean, you can find, like I said, any, anywhere from the obvious to the not so obvious. Yeah, let's talk about that just a little bit. The colors out there. So if someone's choosing a color, I mean, obviously you have different finishes and, and styles you like, but are there certain colors that, uh, you know, maybe for a first time painter are, maybe they don't want to go that direction. Some of them are harder to work with than others. Sure. So you could always pick a solid and it could always be a lighter solid. And where I'm going with this is, you know, determine like what your body work skills are. Like, how perfectly straight is this body? Or should I say, how perfectly uh, straight are you actually looking it to be? Because lighter colors, I've had three white cars. As, as much as I'm into, uh, like I said, the color blue. And uh, I had a black 69 Mustang and I had a black 63 Plymouth uh, Savoy. 
what I always found with black was you can see every minute ripple in the metal. And this could be either from the factory or just like light dings. But some of the lighter colors, it's actually harder to see that. And, and the thing I wanted to mention is, depending on what you're trying to do, I mean, a black job, when they're perfectly straight and polished, they look spectacular, but they show like every piece of pollen. Right. And more importantly, they're really hot. And when I say like really hot, you may have some temperature related problems. Like if you did an older car, black gets so hot in the sun, even when it's not really hot out, because I mean, it just absorbs all the solar radiation, that things like motorcycle gas tanks can actually have venting problems. Perhaps somebody has an older bike that they put a more modern gas cap on. They may want to make sure it's completely vented. I had a, a black with gold leaf Harley Sportster and, and it looked, it, it was nice looking. I mean, it was really just a plain sportster, but right after I did it in black, it was sitting outside at work all day. And when I hit the fuel petcock on, I literally had gas shooting out one of the carburetor vents. Mm. It was so physically hot. So I guess where I'm going with this is black might not be a good color to paint something if you live in a really hot place or even worse yet, if you've built something like a land speed record vehicle, uh, because it's going to get so hot. I have seen a couple situations where there was pressure related problems on, on things like master cylinders for braking systems and all, or even like a, a, a hydraulic clutch because it just wasn't prepared to be that hot. So white or a lighter color may have, may have been a better choice. And obviously, you know, on something like that, you have to think of the person that's inside the vehicle driving. Like my uh, 69 Mach 1 was black. It was an unair conditioned car. And uh, mm. it kind of felt like you were sitting on an old hot water radiator. Uh, it would get so hot inside. It was very, very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, environment matters. And, and you mentioned, too, I mean, just the struggle of keeping it clean looking on a dark exterior. You know, you mentioned the pollen. So maybe for somebody starting out, trending toward those lighter colors is, is the right play. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And on, on a first time attempt, obviously, solid colors would be easy or easier because you don't have to worry about um, bad metallic effect because it's your first time. And I don't want to scare anybody away from that. Base coat, clear coat, metallic is much easier to spray than like, say, the old single stage metallics. In other words, the colors that you would spray and it already had metallic in them and they already had the gloss also. Plus, even if you had disorientation to the metallics, it's very easy to uh, straighten that back out just with spray gun technique. And I don't mean anything uh, that's like serious paint craft, but I mean, just by pulling the gun back, reducing the pressure a little bit. And, and putting a uh, drier last coat on after you've already achieved uh, coverage. Because remember, we're not worried about a base coat, clear coat job being shiny right. until we apply our clear coat. And um, it's a rather unfortunate thing, but vehicles that are in use occasionally get scratched or something. And you might want to do uh, like where you have to re-repair, like just say the fender or the hood, or perhaps you've changed like the hood. It's much easier to uh, spray that part and fade the color into the adjacent panels and then just clear coat. Like if you were putting a hood on, say on a car that had large fender tops, you could fade color into the fenders and then you could just clear the whole thing and no one would uh, see any difference at all. Even if you were like years apart, like uh, you build a road runner and all of a sudden you decided you had to put a, a different hood on it perhaps a different scoop configuration. It's just easier to repair. We've talked a couple of times and we've, we've talked about the importance of practice, right? Let's talk a little bit about that. What's the ideal kind of uh, surface to practice on and you know, what should the, the uh, user be trying to get out of that? And maybe what's something that you don't want to come out of the gates and practice on that's maybe just a little bit too challenging? Yes, this is probably really easier than most people think. You could actually begin on a piece of sheet metal almost like something, a piece of sheet metal that you would buy, perhaps a piece that you were going to do a body repair with. Most sheet metal shops, if you would grab a piece of sheet metal, say two feet by like three or four feet, and you know prep it by degreasing it and then sanding it, 
And the reason I say degrease it, even though it's brand new, it probably has uh, a little bit of oil on it from like uh, the metal manufacturing process. Where I'm going with this is if you merely place that on a sawhorse, like drill a couple holes in each corner, put it on a sawhorse and spray it a couple times and actually spray like you're going to spray the car. In other words, begin with your direct metal primer, spray that on. It doesn't have to be too wet. It's nice and even. You got to remember your spray gun, literally think of it as a very large paintbrush. So this panel's a great way to get used to this. Aim straight at it, be approximately six to eight inches away. And you're going to see that it has about an 11 inch tall pattern. It might be like an inch and a half, two inches wide. You want to overlap that. Now, remember, I'm talking about beginning here, overlapping at least 50%. Like you put the first pass down. So the next overlap will be five and a half or six inches. In other words, approximately half. As you gain familiarity and ease with the spray gun, you you know, you just have to get used to it being part of your hand. You'll be able to actually do a tighter overlap. I mean, a lot of pro painters overlap very tightly, say 70 to 75 percent. But this is for after you get used to it. The best part is put the primer on, say two or three coats. And if it's a sandable primer, let it dry, you know, observe the directions on on the product data sheet, let that dry and sand it down with the appropriate grit sandpaper that the directions for your base coat or your single stage ask you to do. And just ballpark figure, this is going to say probably anywhere between, uh, say, 600 to 800 grit, just depending on which system they're actually using. Once that's sanded down smooth, Apply color to it the same way. You know, for the beginner, about 50, 55% overlap. As you get more familiar, you can tighten that overlap a little bit. Concentrate on keeping a nice, even distance. You know, this is a lot about just moving back and forth with the spray gun. Go all the way across the panel and start moving actually in the air. Pull the trigger and come across the panel so you're completely off of it. Release the trigger and then pull it again. Remember, there's going to be all spray guns have a two position trigger. In other words, as you pull the trigger, you're first going to have air. And then as you pull it further, paint's going to come out of it. Actually, you could air paint the thing just to get the feel of it, to get the feel of the trigger and all. But once you get your panel attached to something so it's vertical, and the only reason I ask people to go vertical is it will compel them not to spray too wet. If it was actually sitting between two saw horses, There's almost no opportunity to get a run in the panel. And this is something that, uh, I mean, so roofs and hoods are a lot easier, but it's the sides of the vehicle, the upright panels, where you're actually going to uh, get a run. So it would be much, much easier for them to start right from the beginning, spray a vertical panel. After that, everything's easy. Something that I did want to mention, because it's happened plenty of times in the past, people will go buy like custom spray cans and attempt to spray a bicycle frame or a a tubular chassis. That's a heck of a lot harder because uh, not only are the flat areas small, but like on a bicycle frame, it's round. Even with a spray can, three passes for, say, uh, an inch and a quarter inch tube. But the hardest part is the tube ends. And, And the tube ends typically at a junction of other tubing. Not just like where the forks would bolt onto a bicycle. That's the easy one. But I mean, when you get back where multiple tubes come together, that's harder. And that could be something that somebody could practice on later. But I I do suggest to people that uh, if they're going to do this, anything like a tube chassis or or if you did, in fact, buy paint to do a bicycle with, it's just a little bit harder where you're almost going to have to cut the corners in first. Much like when you're painting a room with brushes and a roller, you literally go around the wall with a paintbrush before you pick the roller up. So if you were doing tubing, you would have to do something similar to that. And and as a first time um, spray job, um, that could be frustrating and it doesn't have to be. So yeah, learn to paint something flat first that's vertical. And then uh, as your skills increase, you'll be able to pick up doing the smaller things. Now that's not to say that you couldn't paint a set of traction bars because nobody makes them the color you want because you're probably going to have them mounted on something and they just have a beginning and end. But 
anything that's a three-dimensional welded thing, like a cycle frame, a tube chassis, a bicycle frame, it's just going to be a little bit harder. So if you're working on that flat surface and you've worked for a little bit of time, how does one know if they're ready to have at it on the actual vehicle? I, I would have to say that it's usually, if somebody feels comfortable enough, say that they painted that panel twice, maybe three times, you'd have to be your own judge. But I I promise the skills that they pick up doing that panel will translate onto their cars. On on a first-time color, try not to pick anything that's translucent. In other words, layered colors like uh, some of the candy colors that are sold, um, that's much more difficult. And and I always tell people, you know, everybody that's uh, in the specialty vehicles, it does give you a, a great sense of pride when you take that out for the first ride to know that you did it yourself. But if you're in doubt, everybody probably, if they sit down and think about it, knows somebody that does this and maybe they could get some help, you know, from a friend. But yeah, certainly I do encourage people to give this a try on their own, but start on something, like I said, that panel, and it's a great skill builder. I mean, we actually do that uh, sometimes even at tech rep meetings where we'll have everybody spray a panel because what we're really trying to see is in the car world, how much pain is each guy actually putting on the panel? And it's not necessarily so much a thickness thing, but the actual volume of uh, liquid used. Yeah. And you mentioned knowing people. And I think we've even talked about some, you know, classes that you might be able to find locally, right? Many communities will have a vocational technical school that typically is run by the local school system. And oftentimes they have auto body classes at nighttime. And I encourage people to actually go to something like that because those classes are actually loaded with folks like us that are learning so that they can put a paint job on their own car or restore their own car. And it's, it's full of really high interest stories. You know, somebody will have a, a car that's been in the family. I mean, the one car painter that I deal with regularly, he just told me yesterday about his GTX that he had. And I was totally floored. And I said, uh, how did you ever get that? And he said, well, my dad bought it to drag race in the 60s. So I just painted the car over the wintertime. Now, this was a professional car painter, but you know, the whole, the whole hobby is full of stories like that, where your friend or you had a family member that just had a uh, really nice car that stayed in the family forever. You know, and, and the car saw limited usage. But it has a tired paint job and you would like to refinish it. So, yeah, the tech schools are a good place to look. Um, Actually, some of the colleges have body shop programs and guys go in there. The one guy told me the other day that uh, he had actually been going to tech school at nighttime, probably for four years now. And it was just so that he had a place to work on his car. That's resourceful. That's what that is. (laughs) It is. And, And I was just getting a kick out of it. Probably the best things at any show is the sharing that you do with people. And and the sharing half of it is the skills that you're talking about, not just the good times, but I mean, hey, how you did this. And don't ever hesitate. All these guys that are big name painters, just about all the ones I know, are very good about sharing the information. And all you have to do is ask them. And most of these guys are willing. I'm talking even some of the guys that would be considered the stars that are uh, car builders. I had one of my customers at a show afraid to ask the guy what the car color was. So I said, well, I'll go ask him. And it was a beautiful car. I mean, it was a nice roadster. And he said to me, give me your business card. He says, "Uh, I'll call you. He said, but I got to call the shop. I don't even remember. He said, but that was actually, I mean, going back to our original thing, this was actually a real color code off of a current model year car that he just liked it. So he mixed it up. It's great to know that some of these <laughs> these high end guys are willing to share their knowledge as well. So you know that's a that's a great story there. The guy was like, "Oh my gosh, you got him!" I said, "Yeah." He said he gave me <laughs> both color codes. You know, the car was actually two colors, and, and one was a metallic and one was a solid, but they were current model year colors. And uh, I've said to quite a few people that, "Yeah, just ask because uh, these guys are willing to share too." I mean, you know, obviously they'd like to sell the cars that they build, but they also encourage uh, the whole uh, spirit of the hobby, the profession itself. So it's really a good thing. Getting back to the the flat surface, you're testing, you're kind of figured out, you're ready to maybe move on to the actual vehicle. 
where do you start on the physical vehicle to get the best results? Well, it depends on actually where you're spraying the vehicle and like what state of disassembly it's in. Sometimes people will take and have a car completely in pieces. Other times they'll have the car like pre-cut in, like say all the door jams and under the hoods completely done. So let's just talk about the outside of the car. Like I have a uh, 69 Camaro and it's all taped up and it's sitting someplace that I'm going to spray the vehicle. So when I say it depends, if I was in like a spray booth at one of the tech schools, spray booths come in two configurations. In other words, some of them are called downdrafts. The air comes in the ceiling and the overspray laden air actually gets pulled out of the floor. Frequently, they'll have two uh, graded filtered assemblies where the overspray is going out. If I was in a downdraft, I would start on the roof. And on this 69 Camaro, I would do half the roof and come down into the rear quarter panel. In other words, the sail panel itself. And then I would start on the other side. And, and I'll say this. I would actually start right on the edge of the roof, going back and forth from the windshield to the back window, front to back. But I would actually start like where the drip rail is on the car. And the reason I do that is when I then switch to the other side of the car, I now have my wettest edge. And when I'm saying my wettest edge, the last area I sprayed was, say, the center of the roof. And then I would start at the center of the roof, come down the other quarter panel. And in that booth, I would alternate from side to side. I would go from one quarter panel to the other quarter panel and do the trunk. Then go down one door, switch sides, go down the other door. Then I would go front fender, across the hood, same way, start right on top of the fender and go across the hood, down the other side. The thought here is my last overlap on that vehicle per coat will be somewhere on the passenger side fender. Now, the total opposite would be is if I was in a, in a booth that the overspray was being evacuated out of one end of it. I would start the furthest area, in other words, near the incoming air, work my way down the car that way. And same type of thing. I would always push across a top panel, like a trunk lid, roof or hood. And that way, when I switch sides, I would have my wettest edge. And you might not notice this too much with a base coat job, but you'll certainly see it on the clear coat. Because if you started literally in the center, uh, you'll find yourself sometimes having like a dry strip because the paint has started to dry when you, when you switch sides. But if you start on one side and push across the horizontal panel and then begin in the middle, close to the wettest edge, uh, you'll have the best flow out and you'll actually also have a very easy spray job. When something's completely disassembled, uh, as I had spoken about a little bit earlier, and you're painting all the jams and all that at one time, it is a little bit harder. And I would want to say this to someone, sometimes when they're disassembled, particularly as you're beginning, you'll end up uh, with a metallic job that has uh, the fenders look different than, say, the doors. And something very important, if the car is disassembled, you want the doors and like the front fenders in the same position that they will be mounted on the car. And I'll give you an example. A guy had a, uh, a Model T pickup truck, but it was a closed cab truck. And he painted all the panels in different positions. And, and I think there's about 11 body panels on one of them cars. And he picked a charcoal color. And the thing had very much color to color difference from panel to panel. So if you do disassemble, just be aware that... Uh, that you'd like to have everything in the position it would be on the car. So for somebody that is painting in uh, just in their, their garage, for a home garage, I guess the first question on that would be, how do you even prep a home garage if you want a decent finish? Any tips on, on getting something like that set up and, and, and spraying in your own garage? Absolutely. First off, cover everything in the garage with like masking plastic. Um, the stuff that's approximately 12 feet long that comes on a 400 foot roll, cover everything because you don't want to get overspray on anything in there because particularly clear coat, it's going to stick. And this might be a problem uh, with your significant other if you just oversprayed their uh, brand new uh, freezer that they put out 
you, you really want to cover everything or you want to you want to get the things that you care about out of there. I need to say this. If you look at pictures in some of the car magazines, you'll see guys all the time painting in an environment like that. And then you realize they just have a tarp over everything in there. And the stuff that really mattered, like, you know, you don't want to have your nice new motorcycle sitting in the garage there. Get everything out of the garage. And uh, hopefully you have some type of when I say ventilation, like obviously the garage door is going to want to be up and uh, you'd want every window in the place open. And I always say this, I can't stress safety enough. Have a brand new spray mask on and you probably want to wear a pair of disposable overalls because you don't want to come out of there covered in overspray too, because obviously the overspray is going to hang out much longer in a garage, but that's not to say it can't be done. I had done a a Chevy Chevette in a very large garage and it was a drive through and it was one of these beautiful days, like 70 degrees. And there was a light breeze. It had just rained. So everything outside was wet. There wasn't any like pollen or dust in the air. And the car came out great. And I actually had the door away from the breeze completely open. And the door that the breeze was blowing in, I literally used the smoke from a cigarette that I was holding in it in my hand just to see that I had a light breeze going through. You don't want so much breeze that it's hard to spray, but there was plenty of ventilation in that garage. And a lot of garages are actually like that. If you were worried about the floor or something like that, you obviously want to uh, clean up, sweep up the garage, like prep the area. If you had actually done all your body work and your sanding and all that in there, you want to take the vehicle outside first and, and prep the area. And if you need to, just lightly mist the floor with water, just to hold anything down off the floor. Uh, so that it doesn't blow up into the job when you're physically spraying. I did more jobs than I would want to say like that in a garage. And I've painted a lot of motorcycles in a two-car garage that had a walk outdoor on the opposite side. And it came out really nice. And, you know, every once in a while, you'll actually get a job out of a garage before it was ever polished or sanded or anything. I mean, the clear coat itself, where the job comes out so good, you're like, I really don't know how that came out that way. (laughs) You're occasionally going to get a gnat. I would certainly say to somebody, just just a little bug in it, avoid the bugs. This is best done during daylight just because the bugs are not going to be attracted to the lights in your garage. Yeah, that's that's good advice, too. And what about temperatures? Is that just a matter of kind of consulting with the, the tech sheet? Yeah, I would look at the tech sheet, but if I'm if I'm spraying in a garage... I would wait till it's at least room temperature. Like we're actually coming right now with it being um, the end of April. We're coming into a real good time to be able to spray something like that because it'll be near room temperature and it'll stay room temperature. It it actually works better than you think. And there has been award-winning cars come out of people's garages that uh, just looked wonderful. This is the case probably too, where having a attached garage is, is at a disadvantage, right? I mean, because the zooms do go and, you know, I'm sure it's nice to have a little bit of separation if possible. Yes, it is certainly. I, I currently have an attached garage on my house and I've, I've painted nothing in that garage because you don't want the whole rest of the car to uh, have that uh, body shop fresh odor to it. And, and obviously it would be a safety factor too. Uh, not only for the people, but maybe small animals that you would have in the house if it was attached. I I always try to avoid doing that in like a whole car in an attached garage could be hazardous to the the people in the house. So let's go back and talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things you need to have in place, materials for for the garage or shop. I guess we'll start with spray guns and different nozzle sizes, CFM ratings. What do people need to look for in that? Probably going to need a spray gun. And you can talk to a variety of people about there as far as what they use. But let's remember something, too. When we see somebody spraying on TV, just because they use that gun doesn't mean necessarily that that gun works for you. And where where I'm going with this is there's, and I'm just going like semi-alphabetically, everybody has seen a DeVilba spray gun. Everybody has probably seen an Awada or a Sada spray gun. If they're the right tip size, it's going to work well. Now, when I say if they're the right tip size, I mean, typically we're spraying with gun tips 
approximately, say, 1.2 to 1.4 millimeters, and they all make them. But what I would say to somebody, too, is they're going to need compressed air. And make sure, before you go buy a spray gun, does your compressor have enough output to be able to power that spray gun? And where I'm going there is, this is real easy to find. When you buy a compressor, it'll have a CFM rating, uh, cubic feet per minute. Like, like sometimes people have small ones for like a nail gun just to uh, inflate tires with. Would that run an airbrush? Probably all day long. The noise might make you nuts, but uh, the compressor, I mean, but all day long. Uh, but a lot of spray guns take anywhere between 10 cubic feet per minute. Some of the older ones take more, like 16 or 17. Uh, a very unique thing, the spray gun I didn't mention yet, was the um, 3M Performance spray gun. And I mentioned that because that's one gun that has a lot of different tips for it. And for somebody that's doing this the first time, the reason I say that, that has readily available tips that just change by hand without tools from like 1.2 millimeters up to uh, two millimeters. And somebody may say, well, what would I ever need a two millimeter tip for? And this would be for you folks that are doing fiberglass bodied cars that are trying to spray sprayable polyester like after they got done their uh, body work. Obviously on an older fiberglass car, there's going to be a lot of pinholes and loose hairs and all. So somebody would want to use uh, sprayable polyester on that. And the beauty of the 3M gun is if you were using a product like that, that's actually semi-abusive to the spray equipment. It's, it's a nice option because once they're done doing that, they can literally throw the tip away. People have become scared away of stuff like that because, uh, because the gun's actually made of a precision molded plastic. And that's not to say uh, to cheapen it, but because it's actually molded, they can uh, actually have a lot of control without machining, like the way the air cap and fluid nozzles are formed. So they all work great, but there's a lot of options out there as far as spray guns. Yeah. And this would also be based on job size. Awada, Endeville, Sensato all make small spray guns, um, where I would say they're like two-thirds size. A lot of pros would refer to that as like a touch-up gun or a spot repair gun. But that gun would be perfectly suitable for somebody that's painting like a Harley Davidson. In other words, the pattern's like half size. And because the pattern's half size, it's like a six-inch high pattern instead of being an 11-inch high pattern. And most of those guns use significantly less compressed air. Now, it would be a real workout for you. And, and, you know, sometimes you see things and you have to shake your head at, but yeah, I saw a guy try to do a whole van roof and it was an old Dodge maxi van uh, where, where the paint was peeling and he was attempting to paint mm, that 12 foot long thing with a mini jet, a mini style gun. And uh, it just wasn't the appropriate job size thing. But yeah, for the guy that's maybe just going to do a bike, I mean, a motorcycle, when you think of the square feet of area that you're spraying, you could easily do uh, a Harley Sportster or even a Harley Big Twin or even one of the big touring bikes. Like, uh, you know, you inherited your grandfather's Honda Goldwing and it, it's a full fairing with saddlebags and all. You could paint that with one of these smaller guns. You just don't want to run out of air. That's what the whole thing comes down that, to. That's the key. So, you know, you mentioned the new 3M gun and you know, the versatility mm -hmm. there. For a guy who's buying the first gun for his hot rod or whatever, is that a good option? Or do you have a recommendation in, in size and, and all that goes with it? Actually, uh, the gun would work very well on a, a full-size car. And there's many people out there in professional body shops that are using that gun right now, like to actually do a full-size car. It's different. But when I say different, it's as different as, uh, say, somebody that uh, had a really nice Pardon me, like an old Bink 7 gun or an old DeVilvis JGA or, or a modern, a modern piece of SADA spray equipment. If that guy was using a SADA spray gun or a DeVilvis spray gun all the time and they suddenly picked up an Awada, the biggest thing that they would say was it just feels different. But you know what? All spray guns are something that uh, people get used to. That, that, that goes back to the whole practice thing again. If you were to pick up that SRAM performance gun, nice pattern and all, 
it's just slightly different and all the brands sound significantly in other words the sound of the air coming out of them sounds significantly different than each other so uh you know this is just like a, a new sound a new feel just like switching from one brand of gun to the other brand of gun any other tips or common mistakes you see newer painters make any other tips or tricks that you could share uh for those folks uh, yeah, make sure you have a big enough air hose, certainly not more than 50 feet. Um, the way I have my booth set up right now, I'm actually spraying with two 17-foot hoses, and I have uh, air connectors to the wall in the center of the booth on both sides. And that just keeps me from dragging the hose around with me. I have magnets on the end of my air hose, and when I'm going to switch sides, I just stick the hose to the wall, pick the other hose up, and pick it up again. Something I wanted to mention. They want to have like a three eighths inch air hose, not like a real thin one, because it actually gives them more available air. And the last thing I wanted to mention is you probably want to have a filtration unit on the compressor itself that actually has an air regulator. And I'll tell you why. It makes it much, much easier to open the pressure gauge on your gun all the way up. And of course, you're going to have a gauge on the gun. But to set the pressure at the beginning of the hose, and I don't mean what the pressure says there. Say, um, well, I'll use an example. The 3M gun likes to have about 19 to 20 pounds to it. Pull the trigger all the way and adjust the gauge at the beginning of the airline so that you have 19 to 20 pounds at the gun. Great beginning point. Some of the other guns use 24. Some of them use 28 pounds. But if you adjust actually at the wall or at the compressor, it does a couple things. The gun is actually quieter because you don't have direct line pressure. And some people may have the direct line pressure maybe 120 pounds. Some people may have their direct line pressure at 150. It all depends where you're at. It even makes the trigger easier to pull. Nice, consistent pattern. The gun's a little bit quieter. And uh, at the end of the day... It's easier on everything all the way down the line. Uh, it was a good point that you brought up because even a lot of the sanding machines that people may buy, like the dual action sanders, they don't need full line pressure. I mean, if you actually look at the paperwork that comes with them, some will say 60 pounds, some will say 80 pounds. And a couple of the people that work for those companies that I spoke with said, you know, it actually shortens the life of the air tool running too much pressure. And remember, it's not like we're running an impact lug wrench or something. Mm -hmm. We really need to have that initial uh, hit. You know, we're actually doing a uh, rotary style work and many of the air tools today that you sand with actually have uh, like plastic impellers in there that really don't need that much air pressure. What about having a, a, a dryer also hooked up to your, your compressor? It's a great idea because you're not mixing compressed humidity the air that you're spraying with. Just about all these paints today that we're using are actually urethane based and they handle better if the air is drier. I sold a guy an air dryer and he called me two days later after he had the thing installed and he was like, I thought you were crazy. The day I met the guy, the guy said to me, would you rather have perfect compressed air or a perfect spray booth? And I said, I'd rather have a spray area that's nice and stays warm enough and have perfect compressed air. And he told me that the day that he put the new dryer in, all the airlines were purged. So obviously the system was uh, decompressed while the technician was doing this. He said, I saw an immediate difference in the clear coat appearance. And the word he used exactly was, it became effortless. So even if um, paint shop brand paint, it's ready to spray, it's VOC legal. I'm actually acrylic lacquer. I want to say it's like in 12 colors. But even a simple system like that that has no hardener or reducer in it is going to spray nicer and have better longevity because you're liter literally not um, atomizing it. And I mean, just taking it from a stream of liquid, to small droplets that you can spray. You're not mixing it with damp air. And I would anticipate that uh, further down the road, it's going to give you uh, less blistering in the long term, like where you won't have any like moisture marks or something like that 10 years down the road, but you will have way more effortless spraying. 
Ted, I can't thank you enough for your for your knowledge and your time today. Uh, this has been great. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's always a pleasure dealing with you guys. And uh, hopefully I steered more than a couple people in at least a semi-correct direction to make their lives easier when they uh, start doing their projects. And don't let anybody kid you. It looks really hard, but with a little bit of instruction and just applying what you do and getting used to this spray gun in your hands, Anyone with reasonable hand-eye coordination can do this with a little bit of practice. This has been the On All Cylinders podcast. Powered by Summit Racing. Check out new episodes coming soon at onallcylinders.com. Onallcylinders.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.